want to introduce you to those of you who have never um, I mean, I've never been to any of our sessions here in the drama festivals. Also about the, uh, the importance of space as a methodological tool for approaching, uh, approaching tragedy. So anyway, so I, I'm not going to do all of this because I, I don't have much time. But I, I'll try to give you a holistic uh, view of the back. I mean, I assume that all of you have, have read the, the play or... Um, uh, or at least you know the, the, you know the story. Um, and um, I want to focus mainly about the Dionysiac, and through the Dionysiac, uh, try to think about what the play is about. Uh, and I will use mainly two spaces that are key in this play um, um, to uh, help us put it all together and help us think about this is not mine, is it? Um, th no. Um, uh, help us think about the main ideas in, um, in the Bacchae. So, um, so what is the play about? I mean, um, I would never start an undergraduate lecture like this, but um, I, think, um, I think it's a... It's a good idea for me to start by zooming out first, then zooming in, and then zooming out again. I mean, tragedy is always about what it means to be human, isn't it? It's always about the big questions. It's, all about, uh, it's always about what it means to be human, what it means to live in an organized society. Uh, you will get all of these PowerPoint, by, by the way, uh, as well. Um, uh, um, and to be part of human civilization, what, what is the creation that we've made civilization, and really how civilized is it? This is a question that tragedy asks all the time. Um, and, and, and the scholar that I'm very obsessed with, Charles Siegel, is I think the best exponent of this uh, key idea in, in tragedy. Now, in this play, um, we see, I mean, this play reflects on, on, on these ideas. Um, by thinking about contradictions, okay? So the contradictions within humanity, within society, and within civilization, contradictions that seem to be unreconcilable, and asking the really difficult questions. Um, how do we live with these contradictions? Whether these contradictions can actually um, you know, be contained in, in, in our, uh, in our um, society, in our, in our civilization. If, and what do we do with them? And what are, the, um, what are the consequences if we can't manage them? Now, the idea of contradiction, like in the idea of, thank you so much, uh, the idea of contradiction, um, uh, like the idea of uh, uh, regeneration, I think is central uh, in, in the frogs, is central in the Bacchae. Um, uh, uh, um, and, and it is because Dionysus is at the very heart of it. Now Dionysus is the par excellence divinity of, of contradiction. He is the divinity I mean, we, I know that often we talk about Dionysus as the, the god of wine, okay, or um, um, the god of theater. I mean, Dionysus is, of course, all of these things, but it's because he's primarily, he's primarily the, the, um, the divine entity that embodies uh, the idea of collapsing boundaries. So on one hand, we have, I mean, we understand things if we create categories. On the other hand, Dionysus is the, the divine entity that collapses these boundaries himself by being himself um, uh, across boundaries. So I mean, if you think about Dionysus, he's divine, but at the same time, in the Bacchae, what, what we see, I mean, when, uh, uh, he appears as all three, human, uh, animal, and God, okay? Um, he's Greek-born, 
very, the, op the play opens with him talking about his origin in Greece, but he's coming from Asia. So he's at the same time, he's Greek and Oriental. He's a male god, but he's very strikingly female in appearance. Um, okay, and uh, um, he's um, uh, gender, um, he's a being, uh, you know, between genders also uh, leads to one of the most uh, fascinating um, scenes of the play. Um, he, uh, in terms of where he is, um, Dionysus is both a god of nature, of outside of the mountain of wilderness, but he is also a god that possesses the house interior and the interiors of humans. Okay, he turns women into buckets and run, in running hounds, okay, uh, running wild, tearing animal flesh. He also turns them into peace-loving women, okay, who, are, who want to be in harmony with nature. This is the uh, messenger speech. Um, brings, he's equally associated with both um, a, a life, the juices of life, the flowing um, um, uh, 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 energies of life, and death. So I mean, he is, very often you will hear this um, uh, 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 characterization of Dionysus as being a liminal divinity. But in fact, um, I, and, and this, is, this is right, um, but in fact for me and for my students and what really I think excites uh, the, the students when they approach Dionysus and you know, uh, from, from this respect is Dionysus as the divinity that transcends boundaries. And Bacchae has been, yeah, the Bacchae has been built on this, um, on this um, uh, key, key question. Um, now, um, how does this relate to the concept of, to the, um, uh, to the central question of the Bacchae, which is about, um, human civilization. Um, so Dionysus um, is on one hand the god of the wild and the autonomous unpredictable surges of the life energies in nature and in humans as part of nature. Um, okay, but at the same time Dionysus is a force that can be channeled um, to create um, uh, he, he's intrinsically uh, connected with creativity. Um, um, and uh, he's, uh, 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 he's, um, he has this ambiguous relationship between, um, he has this ambiguous relationship with uh, civilization and nature because on one hand he embodies nature, on the other hand he embodies the creativity, all these, um, the, um, the creativity of, of civilization, what makes uh, human, uh, human civilization possible. Um, so even this, I mean, and all the other uh, um, um, uh, antithesis that Dionysus embodies are all integral to, to the human, um, um, uh, 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 um, in, integral to human life. Can, and both, and this is, the, this is the key idea of the Bacchae, both um, the acknowledgement and acceptance and the retainment of, of Dionysus um, on its own can be dangerous, but also the repression of the Dionysiac can also be dangerous. Both of them are necessary um, in, in, uh, uh, in, in uh, human life. So this is a central idea of uh, the uh, Siegel's uh, Dionysiac Poetics and Euripides' Bacchae. Now, I know that all of this sounds a little bit too conceptual for uh, pupils to understand, so uh, I, I, um, I think I'm going to go through it via this antithesis, which is at the very heart of the play, the mountain, and the house. 
And I invite you, once you read your Bacchae again, you will realize how central the mountain is, and how central the house is, and how central this uh, contrast and um, uh, clash between the two um, um, is in the dramaturgy of the play, and how this can be an axis, really, through which we can understand the whole, the whole play. I mean, throughout the play, there is this huge tension between the mountain on one hand, which is the one side of humanity, okay, the bestial side, the wild side, okay, the uncivilized side, and the, the, and the, the house on the other hand, which seemingly nominally uh, okay, is, um, is, is the entity that can be um, connected with the civilized, um, okay, the, um, that the, 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 the tamed. And there is this, this big contrast between the two that runs throughout, throughout the, um, the play. Um, now, if you think about the way the, uh, the play unfolds, um, um, what the mountain stands for is crucial for Pentheus. And Dionysus arrives uh, in Thebes, um, and after he introduces himself um, and explains the reason that he's, um, he's arrived in, in Thebes, uh, he and his uh, retinue take to the mountains. Um, Okay, now this is um, where, I mean, the, the following, um, in the following scenes, we see also that the whole of the city has been um, 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 incited to uh, dancing and um, bucking revelry and taken to the mountains, and we see the two old men uh, um, um, themselves having become, having become bucking. Um, and getting ready to go on the mountain. And this is where we encounter uh, Pentheus and we hear for the first time about his disgust with this new phenomenon of the Dionysiac that's happening in Thebes and, um, and, uh, and also and, and his uh, determination to uh, uh, bring everybody back from the mountain, back into the city, into the civilized space. Okay, into, um, uh, 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 into the non-Dionysiac. Um, because for Pentheus, uh, um, the, uh, the Dionysiac is, uh, is the threat. So, uh, it's basically, so um, um, this space then, it's far more than just um, a background for the action. Um, Mountain in the play embodies okay, the Dionysiac, and, and uh, Pentheus perceives it, um, perceives the Dionysiac as untamed, uncivilized, okay, as a threat to the order of the polis. Hence, he's, uh, as, we, uh, as we see, he's trying to bring um, the, uh, the citizens of Thebes um, uh, from uh, the world spaces back into the city. Um, so for, because for Pentheus, okay, order and civilization um, are embodied by the oikos, okay, by the palace, and uh, as a result by the polis. Okay, the mountain has no place in the orderly and supposedly civilized um, uh, world of uh, Pentheus. I mean, there is this huge tension as I said, between the two spaces that last throughout the play. Um, so Dionysus, and we see now how the play unfolds. Dionysus is, um, uh, uh, <coughs> who is perceived as the threatening, okay, and, and the element that needs to be contained. Um, he, uh, Pentheus sends, sorry, I don't remember how, um, um, uh, so yes, so Dionysus is in the mountain and Pentheus sends for him and for the Bacchans to be arrested and contained. So you see this um, contrast between control and 
staticness on one hand with Pentheus, uh, containment, and on the other hand, escape and liberation movement um, away that is um, uh, uh, the, uh, associated with the Dionysiac. Um, 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 hence, I mean, under this uh, I, I, um, contrast between um, the uh, uh, containment and the non-Dionysiac and um, um, escape and freedom um, uh, uh, as the Dionysiac, you can see many of the events that happen in this, in this play. So you have uh, Dionysus being arrested and then Pentheus um, trying to um, chain him, but it is not possible for him to be chained. Um, and then uh, 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 Dionysus uh, um, uh, reacts by bringing the whole of the palace down through an earthquake. Um, I mean, all of these are very significant uh, um, uh, very significant actions that, that happen in the play that, that are all tied to this main kind of backbone um, of the play, um, which is the tension between Dionysiac and undionysiac, or mountain and, and polis, or mountain and house. Um, so, um, uh, so, let me see. Um, um, uh, um, okay, so I think, um, um, so, uh, um, so if you, if you remember, I mean, this is a crucial point, um, uh, between, that it's a crucial point in the play where, uh, Pentheus, tries to retain and uh, uh, chain Dionysus or uh, chain uh, the backhands, and that's not possible. Uh, because it, this is the point where Dionysus brings the whole of the palace down through an, through an er earthquake. Okay. So we see here the, this unleashing of the Dionysiac powers um, against the, this par excellence symbol of the symbolized order, the house. And I often like to use this image as kind of, you know, this is a kind of the, the Bacchae uh, captured in one image as oikos versus wilderness, oikos versus nature, oikos versus the mountain. Um, okay. Um, <coughs> so, um, I mean, this is a, a, a very short, and I'm, I'm trying to run through this, and it's, I think it's a little bit, um, it's a little bit difficult. Uh, but um, um, this is, I think, one way in which um, we can think about the Dionysiac without um, thinking only in abstract terms. I think, I think students respond well to uh, thinking in terms of space and in terms of uh, physicality. Um, and I find that this central contrast between the mountain and, and the house is quite, um, is quite capturing. Now, if you, if, you, if you now look at the play um, and, and, try to pimp and try to see um, um, how and whether, you know, the, the um, uh, the play actually does operate with this contrast. You will see um, this contrast everywhere. First of all, this, the, the play, as also we will see, I mean, as, as uh, largely with the frogs, but also as I will see with uh, Oedipus Tyrannus, the play um, unfolds very much in spatial terms. Dionysus presents himself as a god in very spatial terms. So it's when he first present him, presents himself, it's all about, um, okay, it's all about the earth, that the light, that the smoldering earth, 
that now have the lightning of Zeus has created about Dionysus being born from this earth and yet um, 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 being perceived as, come, as having come from abroad. Um, okay, um, he, he talks about um, um, this, uh, uh, the effect on the people of Thebes, that he liberated them into, um, he, he caused them to, um, um, to take to the mountains. Um, and, and this is very much an expression of what the Dionysiac stands for. Um, on the other hand, I mean, you see all the references to the houses <coughs> as the spaces that um, the Dionysiac has an effect on. So here we see the, um, the, uh, this contrast between the uh, inside and the outside from the very beginning. And then, um, 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 one of the most interesting ways to think about space, in my view, in the Bacchae is, um, is to think about this key scene of the collapse of the house. Now, I don't know if, um, I mean, some of you, um, I don't know if uh, uh, we've um, had any sessions before. I mean, what is, what Greek tragedy uh, does consistently and in every play is it gives an enormous symbolic significance to the house. Not only as we saw it now, so we saw the contrast between the Dionysiac uh, embodied in the mountain and the wilderness on one hand and um, uh, you know the controlled orderly space embodied in the house on the other, but also the house as a space that embodies, in a way, the, the psyche of the central character. So very much um, what happens with, um, what happens in the interior um, of those, of, of, uh, in the interiors of tragedies. I mean, if you think about every single tragedy, um, how important the space of the house is, Especially in relation to, and think now already about Oedipus Tyrannus. Think uh, especially in relation to the past, okay, that is often suppressed or forgotten or unrealized, okay, um, that hides secrets, that hides thoughts and desires, okay, that are memories. Um, um, I mean, it is, see, this is. Um, understanding the importance of the in house interiors in, in relation to the psychology, as it were, of the characters. Um, I, I, um, I mean, I, I, find this, I find this connection, I mean, it's, it's extremely common uh, in, in, in tragedy. I mean, if you think about from the Orestia, for example, okay, all the past, all the secrets, everything that is suppressed, everything that is horrific, um, is associated, you know, with the house, and, and then you see the furies, you know, in the house. Similarly, you know, in Oedipus Tyrannus. But, um, so there is, a, there is a very, very clear and consistent connection between the characters' minds and memories and psyches with that space. So now, this is really, and I, I mean, I apologize again if this is kind of quite rushed, but if you think about this and you think about the scene of the earthquake where Dionysus makes the house collapse, this is just before Pentheus turns into that frightful thing that, you know, Dionysus has created. This is when He's, you know, um, I mean, you can say, you know, his own psyche kind of lets go and all of these repression and suppression that 
that you you see about Pentheus collapses and Pentheus accepts to be dressed as a minor and take up to the mountain. Um, yes, please. Sure yes, yes, yes. You know, I'm, I'm, for my students, every year I get to that the earthquake scene. Yes. Uh, and of course, he's been in the stables as well. Yes, yes, yes. And my students convinced me. One year they convinced me the whole palace was supposed to collapse. One year they convinced me, no, 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 it's just a sort of everybody on stage thinks it has, but actually it hasn't physically. When the audience isn't supposed to think the whole palace has come down, just the stables. Okay. Is there no. an answer? Yes, yes, definitely. I mean, look. So when we have ha interiors, I mean, that, that's the thing, so, um, so I teach interiors almost throughout the year, so, uh, um, but I, I'll try to be very brief here, okay. Um, I, I mean, you take these interiors, I mean, so in terms of stagecraft, I, definitely the palace is shown as collapsed in some symbolic way, okay? So, um, um, so you, have, you have the dancing of, of the chorus and then, I don't know, maybe a column would have collapsed and, and the, the audience would perceive the, um, uh, 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 the palace as having collapsed, but it's not so much about, what I'm trying to say is that interiors, like all sorts of spaces in Greek theater, they're not meant to be understood only on representational terms. If we understand the house or the palace only as a palace, then we've missed 70% of the tragedy. That's why we didn't have scenography, most likely, in tragedy, because if you start making something too specific, then it loses that symbolic value that it has, okay? So we have a palace here, which is at the same time um, captures the psyche, the innards okay, of our main character who resists Dionysus, that at that point starts to collapse, and the house collapses as well. Uh, I don't know, including the stables. I mean, the interior collapses. That controlled space, that space of um, um, civilization and human achievement and orderliness just collapses. Um, and so, uh, so yes, so the answer is, and I think there's a lot of modern tragedies that do this well, the answer is that, uh, yes, it collapses, but it collapses on more than one level, so not only on a representational level. And actually, the symbolic level is more important. On a representational level, I'm pretty sure you would show I mean, you would, you, would, you would enact the earthquake by dancing, okay, by music, by, um, and also, I don't know, possibly with, you know, one piece of the set. Um, but more importantly, and if you have understood the, diff the, the key, the contrast between <laughs> house and mountain, you take it that the house has collapsed because the psyche of Pentheus here is undergoing a radical, radical change. Um, so sorry, does this answer your question? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. okay. Um, okay, so um, I, I mean, every year at the drama festival, I'll end up talking about interiors, just because interiors are so extremely important. Start thinking about, I mean, we've done Antigone and the House of Oedipus. We've done Medea, okay. <laughs> Um, uh, we've done Medea that opens, I mean, for 250 lines, you, you hear the heroine, but you don't see her, you only see that enormous building, okay, that enormous um, interior dark space. And, and the association between the two, between, you know, the, um, the psyche of the heroine and, and the interiors of the house is, is immediate. Um, I mean, the Oresta is all about the interiors. The Lysistrata is about, I mean, Lysistrata is so, uh, so much, you know, staging that sexual um, uh, uh, strike on blocking the men out of those interiors. And that interior is the inside of the human body. And the inside of the human body that produces that wealth and that life 
that the men want to have access to in order to wage wars. And so, I mean, it's, it, interiors play a huge role in, in Greek tragedy. And I would be more than happy if you wanted to give you uh, uh, some scholarship on that, if you want to introduce your students to these ideas, because my students take to it incredibly well. Um, and, and, and they do wonders with interiors. Um, OK, so um, 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 so yes, so the interior of Pentheus, okay, um, the mind, OK, so is the only interior that still resists the Dionysiac when the play opens. OK, and uh, he wants his house and his city to remain that way. OK, Pentheus tries to confine others in interiors, but that's not possible. Um, when Pentheus' interior is invaded, invaded by Dionysus, the result is as unsettling and as destructive as we see in physical and spatial terms the earthquake that has struck the house earlier on. He becomes the vehicle for the gods' revenge on the humans for having resisted an essential part of human nature, okay, the Dionysiac, and suppressed it with a misconceived civilized rational order. Um, how does the play end? The play ends where the mountain takes a really huge role. And um, Pentheus himself, when he, just before he ascends the mountain, and in his kind of new transformed um, existence, okay, um, he's like looking forward to becoming a minad, and he says to uh, uh, Dionysus, oh, will I be able to carry the mountain with me? And then when he dies, I mean, this is, um, um, you know, this is very much, yeah, this is uh, exactly the, the words from the play, the mountain, it's the mountain that killed him. Okay, in the horrific events of the play's last scene show the mountain itself invading the house of Pentheus. The Dionysiac is experienced in its most destructive facet. Okay. Um, I <laughs> Uh, okay, so, but I mean, as, as you can see, so I want you to understand, though, that uh, we start with the assumption of oikos as the place that is associated with the civilized, the orderly, okay, um, uh, and kind of mountain perceived as the disorderly, okay, but then we see how the two collapse together. We see also how both of them, we see how nature and the mountain embodies civilized um, values. We see also how the house, especially in the way that um, Pentheus is associated with, embodies um, um, barbarian values. And we see how the two spaces are, I mean, they're, they're contrasting, but at the same time, I mean, they are they're necessary almost for each other, okay? They are, uh, um, and uh, I mean, going back to talking about space and how space can help us understand uh, characterization, psychology, and um, so I want you to, to think about these, um, these two, and values, I want you to think about these two spaces as emblematic of, um, of the of the key key ideas of the play. Sorry, I I, I I'm trying. To, I, I think I, I wasn't a, a good. I, and I, I I know that probably I've kind of confused some of you, but I tried to kind of jump too much into 45 minutes. I hope you've got um, most of it. And uh, um, I'm sure that if when I give you when you want to when I give you what. I would suggest is worth kind of reading. I would say that um, yeah, each one of you can kind of create their own, their own kind of take on this. Um, I mean, this contrast between house and mountain, or house and wilderness, is again a contrast. I mean, you won't be surprised, is one that is, uh, is, is really crucial for Oedipus. Okay, I mean, you can see that space is really everywhere. Um, and um, I mean, in my teaching, it's, um, uh, um, in my teaching, I 
I mean, I, it's not only because in my research I focus a lot on space, it's because, um, uh, it's also because some of the best scholarship, um, I mean, including, I don't know, um, um, okay, Oliver Taplin, okay, he's a classic on, on Greek tragedy. Um, and uh, uh, if you read the introduction, I mean, okay, so this is um, the introduction that Oliver Taplin has written uh, for, um, uh, uh, for this play. He thinks very, very spatially. Um, he thinks very, very much in terms of, uh, of house and mountain. And, and in fact, um, the ending of the play, which has been very, very much discussed, as in why isn't Oedipus expected to go back on Kithiron? Isn't Oedipus expected to be exiled, you know, away from the city? And then he's, you know, contained inside the house. What's the meaning of that? I mean, this is a... Um, um, so house, uh, house spaces and, you know, outside spaces. Uh, yeah, it's important also here. And they're important, I mean, they're important in almost every Greek tragedy. Um, um, uh, okay, um, so, I mean, I think maybe may next time I'll, I'll uh, organize this, maybe a, li a little bit better, but, um, um, so, uh, uh, um, so let me, um, yeah, let me, let me give you a, a snapshot of what, how I, I'm kind of planning to tackle this kind of holistic approach to, uh, Oedipus. Um, uh, um, okay, um, so first of all, because I was a little bit, you know, alarmed by how important hamartia and uh, other concepts like that are, um, you know, in, um, in OCR's approach to uh, Greek tragedy, I decided to, to put some of that uh, in here. But then, um, I try, I, I have my own um, approach to such ideas, again through the dramaturgy of the play and space in, in particular. Um, so, I mean, um, often I see that people read Oedipus Tyrannus via Aristotle. I mean, Aristotle's readings of Oedipus Tyrannus are commendably, but they are one and rather narrow way of reading Oedipus Tyrannus. Aristotle is not really in um, He doesn't really pay attention to um, the opsis. Um, and then, um, I mean, once, I mean, it's, it's a shame because um, it's a shame that there's so much emphasis on uh, and the Aristotelian understanding of theater, um, given the complete indifference of Aristotle on meaning that is created, you know, visually, uh, as we saw, uh, for example, in both the frogs and in the, um, in, uh, in, in um, uh, the Bacchae. Um, so it is a shame that that we, we approach Oedipus Tyrannus via concepts like catharsis and hamartia, and um, which are, I mean, they, they have validity in themselves, but I would say that they're no more valid than any other of the readings of, um, that, that have been, you know, uh, made of Oedipus Tyrannus um, throughout the century. Um, uh, I mean, the, the history of Hamartia in particular, um, I mean, is a really kind of, kind of tragic one because, I mean, through the Renaissance and the emphasis of kind of the moral reading, the uh, reading of Hamartia as a kind of moral flaw, unfortunately, um, Hamartia has, has stayed until today um, um, often, you know, being understood as kind of the moral flaw or, okay, sometimes intellectual flaw of the main character that explains their downfall. Hmm. Um, 
I mean, there has been a very, very um, um, long debate about hamartia and its validity for understanding a uh, 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 Greek tragedy. And uh, as, as late as, as early as, I don't know, 1950s, Dodds himself wrote an article on, uh, sorry, uh, article, and which I've also included in, in the USB that I've given you, called On Misunderstanding Oedipus Rex. And this is about um, kind of, um, this is about misunderstanding specifically about, uh, misunderstanding specifically this concept of hamartia. Um, uh, I mean, back in the 1950s that uh, Dodds wrote this article, already a few people had already refuted um, um, this kind of understanding and this, um, you know, of, of hamartia. And nevertheless, I mean, it still pers uh, persists until, until today. Um, I mean, I mean, you uh, personally, I mean, you won't be surprised. I I don't use Aristotle for uh, approaching uh, Greek tragedy at all because I find Aristotle limiting. Um, um, I, I we approach Aristotle only after um, we've um, um, uh, looked at um, Greek tragedy more more holistically, including you know, the visual aspect uh, of Greek tragedy that Aristotle is not interested at all in. Um, um, but I mean, so what I want to, what I, what I believe is that Aristotle's approach to uh, tragedy is but one of the many approaches. And all of them have got some validity, but all of them also have got massive limitations as well. Um, so, um, I mean, throughout the 20th century, we've seen um, um, readings that focus on, for example, fate, freedom, and responsibility, um, how, you know, the hero is a puppet in the hands of the gods. Um, we've seen um, um, the Freudian uh, approaches uh, um, through the subconscious. We've seen ritual approaches. Um, we've seen approaches through the uh, hero, um, a heroic temper. We've seen approaches through um, um, uh, um, uh, um, um, the um, in, in the late 19, in the 19, late 1980s and 90s through in the democratic ideology. I mean, uh, I was amused to see the, um, one of the questions in the uh, OCR, I think, material that, that I read about um, Oedipus as a, as a detective story. I mean, all of these approaches have validities. I'm, I'm sure that they all have. Um, 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 but, I mean, it is worth exploring the play uh, every time I knew, and I am hoping that with um, kind of the, the approach to in a more in a in a way that um, um, gives a lot gives more pays more attention to the dramaturgy of the play um, will um, um, will will uh, will add even more value. I mean. The reason that I insist on dramaturgy and space is because Greek theatre is not, Greek theatrical texts are not novels. They create meaning through words, but they create meaning in addition to that through action, okay? through um, uh, spectacle, through dramaturgy, through space, through vision. And the uh, Leaving that out of the, um, of the equation, in my opinion, suggests leaving out 70% of the meaning of the play. Uh, it may be not be 70% uh, for everybody, but we certainly leave a big part of the play out. Anyway, I will try to show this for Oedipus as well. Um, now, I'm sure that I, everyone has you know, thought about this before. Like, why, why, is, why does this play have got such a lasting power? I mean, Oedipus as, a, as an everyman, okay? The story of Oedipus as, as a story that can happen to 
everyone the story of somebody who has very firm beliefs about their life, okay, created stories that look obvious about themselves, and yet these suddenly ca all come crashing down. I mean, this is, this is a, um, a classic um, storyline. The other day um, I was watching, I think a bit late, uh, later than everybody, Dr. Foster. I don't know if anybody saw that. Um, and this, this has been very much likened to Medea, of course. I mean, there are very clear evocation of Medea, but for me, the main storyline of Dr. Foster is like this, this um, remarkable character that um, discovers how all the stories that um, she believes about her life all, you know, suddenly come crashing down and her past is not what, you know, she uh, 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 expected it to be. Um, um, so, as, as you will see, um, I will try to show you how the play um, really creates meaning again by, you know, by looking very much, by using very much spaces and key spaces that play a crucial role in the life of Oedipus. So, um, um, and with one of them being the crossroads, okay, I mean this is uh, uh, the crossroads, the, the, the place where three roads uh, meet. Uh, meet. Um, um, so, Oedipus uh, King is one of the very few plays that focuses, I mean, all plays focus enormously on the past, but um, Oedipus King is a, is a tragedy that focuses almost entirely in reconstructing the past, okay? Um, hence, the whole play is about finding, okay, searching, seeing, knowing, understanding, it's permitted with the, the language of, 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 of searching and finding and reconstructing and interrogating. Um, now, this process of reconstructing the past uh, in the play is mapped on key spaces. Um, and we have and of the unfolding of the play in order of realization from Thebes, okay? Uh, a, a description of a land that is plagued, that is diseased, that is sterile, that is instead of producing life, it only, uh, only emanates death. Um, uh, from this space, from the space of Thebes, okay, um, which interestingly also Thebes is one of the places like Athens that human life is very much associated with. So um, the people of Thebes um, they perceive themselves as born from the earth. Okay? Um, so Thebes is a place that, that um, only bears death now. Um, um, to, um, the next stage of the investigation where Oedipus realizes the importance of the place where the three roads meet, um, to then his realization of all these pronouncements throughout the play that um, we've heard both from the chorus and from Tiresias in, in relation to the importance of the Kithiron, okay? Uh, of the Mount Kithiron, again Kithiron, like um, the uh, Bacchae. Kithiron here, though, as the place that is, has marked the beginning of life of, of Oedipus, the place that preserved him as a baby. Finally, as the play um, goes towards its ending, um, we zoom into the interiors of the house, and as it becomes, uh, as um, um, uh, Oedipus, um, um, uh, lunges into it to find his uh, wife who has uh, committed suicide with the house taking all this metonymy of a bedroom 
and um, the kind of the the past about the past stories, the, the past the realization of incest, and um, um, it now uh, becomes clear for Oedipus. Um, uh, now, um, these are, a key, and, and of course, a seemingly neutral space, which is um, um, uh, uh, Corinth, um, uh, which kind of Oedipus refers to so innocently and with such certainty in the beginning, yet it proves, it turns out to be um, uh, uh, one, uh, again, uh, a, a dis quite a deception for him. But um, uh, still, okay, so key spaces in Oedipus, the Thebes, okay, the place where the three roads meet, Mount Kithiron, okay, as almost a metonymy of another mother of his, to the house, okay, to the bedroom of his parents, okay, the womb of his mother, and um, the womb that he himself, okay, entered. Um, both as a, I mean, he existed inside both as a, as a fetus but also as a, as a bridegroom. Um, now, the play itself again, and I'll try to show this to you, the play itself again, um, I, and I, I don't know if you've, uh, maybe you've not, if you haven't noticed this in the translation, I, I, I'm sure that you, you will see it now. Um, um, draws a lot of attention to this where, okay, so it's, it's not about, so for Oedipus, who is looking for his identity, um, is not so much about, um, it's, it's not only about who he is, but as he hears from others and as he himself wanders and searches, it's also about where he is. So as, as Taplin actually uh, says, you know, very, very, um, successful in his introduction, but this is also something that uh, Charles Siegel, I mean, everything that I I'm going to tell you is basically Charles Siegel. Um, 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 so, I mean, seemingly the etymology of Oedipus is, as we all know, okay, coming from oid and pus, so the swelling of the feet of the baby created by binding his feet when he was exposed on Kithiron. But there is another uh, um, uh, quite uh, another interesting etymology of, of um, Oedipus's name as an expression of his identity. Um, oida, which is um, uh, the word, the verb that means to know or to see, and pu, where. Um, and then um, where. Oedipus is, or who he is in relation to all these spaces that have determined his life, um, uh, is something that is found echoed in, in the words of, of many of the other characters, especially Tiresias and the chorus. So this is uh, apart from um, Tiresias' is, um, um, this is um, after um, uh, Tiresias has refused to speak to um, um, Oedipus, and um, he, uh, um, uh, Oedipus has accused him of, um, you know, of being a conspirator against him. And then um, Tiresias, uh, this is where he opens his mouth and starts revealing things to, uh, to Oedipus when Oedipus is now not ready anymore to listen. So Tiresias says, you may be king, but I still have an equal right to make reply. Uh, so I, do not write me down in Crean's list. And since you have insulted me as blind, now listen. You have your sight, yet do not see the truth of how the place you are at is bad, or where you live, or who they are you share your home with. Okay, where Oedipus is, um, is equated in this play with who Oedipus is. Um, and this is where kind of thinking about the space of the house um, kind of starts becoming really um, interesting. He, um, uh, the, the, uh, Tiresias continues, do you know what people you are from? 
you realize you're an enemy to your own king below the earth and here above. Okay. One day the fearful footed curse from mother and from father shall with double spike expel you from this land. You see, and now here, this is, this is now one of the most famous and the most actually echoed in the play uh, passage. There is no anchorage. Um, so the, this is the metaphor of okay, the ship of state, but this is, this is, there is no anchorage, no hollow of Kitharan's mountainside that shall not resonate in echo to your cry once you have learned about your marriage song and what a treacherous harbour home you entered in full sail, thinking your voyage fair. I mean, this is a kind of heart-wrenching, almost, kind of pronouncement of, uh, 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 by Tiresias about um, Oedipus's life voyage, um, uh, back in uh, life voyage, he, in his tragic place being in a marriage um, having entered his home um, um, and the body of his mother okay, as a as a groom I mean this this um, um, uh, 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 presentation of Kithiron the mountain and its slopes and its curves, and um, it's as the association of these images with the harbors, okay, these curves that accept um, kind of the entering of Oedipus inside. I mean, they are once again. I mean, this is a very clear evocation of. Um, it's a very clear use of you know, space metaphors to express um, kind of crucial key events in Oedipus's life and in particular, um, I mean the main event that is echoed again and again and again through spaces, both spaces of mountain hollows and um, but also the space of the house is, um, yes, the, the space of his mother's body that, that he entered. I mean, incest is, n is spoken about a couple of times only in the play openly, but it is, I mean, it is echoed throughout in descriptions like these. And even if you go back and, and you look at the diseased land, the earth, that has been violated and gives birth to nothing anymore, I mean, this is, I mean, I mean, there's a very clear association there of earth and land, okay, with that, you know, female body that has been entered by kind of the wrong, the wrong um, agent there. Um, um, uh, um, and see how this, this idea, this metaphor is again echoed later on. I mean, at the very end, almost, um, when Oedipus has just realized um, what he has done. Now, though, what a different story. Who is housed with wilder grief? Can you see? I mean, this general Greek tragedy has got a very, very strong spatial language. Um, but, and I'm glad, I mean, so I've used, it, uh, I've used Oliver, Oliver Taplin's um, translation here because just he renders it so well. Who is housed with wilder grief, who sunk in deeper misery with the reversal of his life? You, all too, all too famous Oedipus, you have made the voyage twice into one engrossing harbour. Okay, see the curvature of the harbour. As a child you grew there and then you plunged in as a husband, coming back as groom there. How could they, your father's pharaohs, mold in married by your plough? And now remember all the kind of agricultural and natural imagery that pervades the play that is so kind of so distorted um, in light of the incest. How endure so long in sorrow, never crying out aloud? Okay. So, um, um, uh, <coughs> um, so, um, 
Now, yeah, going to what I mentioned kind of very briefly, the play opens in a, in a, in a striking way with a description of the land suffering from disease and plague. Um, but again, I mean, I, I mean, the language of Sophocles does allow us or does make us make a connection with the miasma okay, that has taken place um, in, in this land. So, I mean, one of the first things, yeah, we, we hear about, about Thebes is its kind of yeah, disease state. And then just in case it hasn't been made, kind of the, the importance of this space having been violated so much, we have a, 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 almost half of the uh, choral entry song uh, emphasizes the state of the earth again and again. So numberless the pain I bear in, uh, all our land is sick, and my mind can find no spear to drive this plague back. There are no fruitful grains uh, growing from the earth. And women's fears, see how the earth and women's bodies are connected very uh, immediately. Uh, and women's fears, labor pains bring child, no child to birth. You can see life after life fly like birds, soar faster than fires, uh, spreading breath to death's western shore. Um, numberless, my city is dying, bodies on the earth, plague ridden, children lying uncared for in death. Okay, um, um, and so on. Um, sorry. Uh, so, second space that we really kind of mentioned. Okay, the crossroads. Um, uh, Taplin there has a really um, uh, um, a very useful map um, that shows um, I mean where exactly this this place. I mean the three, the number three, in uh, in Greek imagination is quite important. Like you know other numbers like seven or nine or twelve. I mean these are quite you know um, uh, uh, numbers that are ridden with uh, with symbolism. Um, uh, <coughs> but the um, uh, this is um, a part. Oops, sorry. This is a part of the. Um, uh, uh, yeah, this is this is the second uh, important space in kind of the, the life journey of Oedipus. Okay, and his his journey of discovering his identity. Um, you know, the place where the three roads meet. This is. A, I mean, a, I mean, it exists in in reality. In, even in antiquity, it was actually a. Uh, it was a, a tourist attraction. Um, so the road between Delphi, where um, the roads of De between Delphi and Thebes meet with um, the road that led to Daulis. Um, uh, actually, um, Oedipus's life journey, I mean, started um, in Thebes. He was taken to Mount Kithiron to die as a baby. This is where the exchange happened. Oedipus was taken to Corinth. When he was a very young man, he said he, at, at the symposium he heard that he may not be who he is. He may not, he's, he doesn't know his roots. So he starts the journey of finding his roots by crossing the water across to um, the harbor of Delphi, taking the oracle at Delphi uh, um, that he will kill his mother and sleep, uh, he will kill his uh, father and uh, sleep with his mother. Um, and then, um, knowing this, he tries to avoid Corinth, so he goes the other side, the other way, and then three roads, this is where, you know, the clock really starts ticking, where he encounters, he, he meets his father, and the first part of the oracle is, is, um, uh, uh, is, um, um, fulfilled. Um, and then goes to Thebes, so essentially there is, this is kind of the journey of, um, of Oedipus in kind of search of his, I mean, the journey of Oedipus's life and his journey in sense of his identity. And, I mean, when Oedipus, again, I mean, it is a key space because when Oedipus, as we saw with, um, okay, the Kithiron and, um, and the mother's hollows and the mother's body, uh, it is a key space because this is also another space that a Oedipus um, calls upon when he realizes, you know, what he has done. Oh, you three roads and secretive ravine and thicket with that narrow place where three ways meet, who drank my blood spilled by my hands, blood of my father's blood, 
Do you remember still the acts that I committed there? Okay, th this is a, one of the spaces that he's um, evoking when he realizes what he has done. Um, and the other space is um, uh, Kithiron, and Kithiron is actually um, 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 uh, uh, um, is actually for me this is probably the most the most fascinating space in uh, in uh, Oedipus Tyrannus, um, as it is the space that marks um, should have marked. Oedipus is death, but in fact, it, mer you know, it, it marked his earlier years, and it's the place that he longs to return to at the end of the play. Okay, he says, um, you, should not even, you should not ever make this city of my father's have to harbor me alive in it. This is where he's talking to Creon, telling him, you know, I, I should be exiled. I am the one who is, you know, who is polluted this land. I should be exiled, let me leave this, let me go and live up in the mountains, there, this mountain which is famed as mine, my own Kithiron. Again, the place my mother and my father, when alive, had designated as my proper tomb. Uh, so then I will die as they had meant to do away with me. Now this is, um, I, I mean, as we saw before with the Baca in relation to the mountains, mountains, if you think about Greek myths that you know, mountains really capture Greek mythical imagination. And um, uh, they're often, in, in mythical tradition, they're often uh, spaces where kind of primordial beginnings and endings uh, take place. Um, the gods, for example, gods are born on mountains. Um, or um, uh, after kind of the, the flood of the equivalent flood of Noah uh, that we have in, in Greek mythology, the, the, the ark reaches a mountain and this is where humanity starts you know, growing again from. I mean, m mountains are really significant uh, spaces in, in mythical imagination it's just because, I don't know, this roughness, this outwardliness, this mystery that they have that is, and the Mount Kithiron is, is very much connected with the beginning and in the mind of, of Oedipus, the end <coughs> of his life. Um, I mean, the, the ending of, uh, oh, this is, oh, I think I was a bit too ambitious. Uh, I think I, I want to leave, um, I want to leave uh, time for, um, uh, at, at least for some questions. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of bombarding you with ideas. Um, um, so, I mean, we, we just saw, and, and earlier on, Tiresias had said that Kithiron will echo with your screams when you find out who you are. Um, okay, and, and Oedipus asks to be allowed to go you know, back to the mountain, okay, to, be, to, 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 to die there. Um, and yet, this doesn't happen at the end of the play. And it's very interesting that it doesn't happen. And it definitely has a meaning that it doesn't happen. I mean, on one hand, we're, we are not strangers to surprising endings by Sophocles, and we're not strangers especially to open endings by Sophocles, and endings that make us think, really, like, you know, make us use our kind of interpretative um, forces there to kind of make sense of what's happened. Um, why is it that Oedipus doesn't, you know, go up, doesn't, he's not allowed to go up on the mountain at the, the end of the, the play? Um, now, I'm sure that somebody who, um, even before Siegel said what, uh, what he had said about the mountain and the house and the importance of these spaces for understanding Oedipus Tyrannus, in 1963, one of the most famous set designers um, in the history of kind of modern productions of Greek drama, Joseph Spoboda, created you know, one, of the most, one of the most iconic sets for Oedipus Tyrannus, which was a seemingly endless staircase. Um, that was in Prague in 1963. Um, 
And uh, in the, one of the most iconic scenes of kind of modern productions of Greek drama, uh, Oedipus at the end was seen as climbing this seemingly endless um, staircase. I mean, a, a very powerful image of continuing suffering, but also endurance, okay, which is, in fact, kind of the heart of the play. I mean, the, you know, uh, Oedipus's continued suffering, but also um, uh, his, um, his endurance, okay, the feat of his endurance as a, as a tragic hero. I mean, to me, in some way, this uh, set almost captures what, I mean, what should have been the ending of Oedipus Tyrannus, okay? That should have been, um, um, uh, um, with, with Oedipus ascending the mountain, okay, towards his, I mean, to, to, I mean, as in, as in, as I guess, as I said, as a spatial image of continued suffering, kind of, but also as, as endurance. And we have two other plays of Sophocles, in fact, end in very similar ways. One of them is the women of Trachis, where, again, Heracles, uh, um, uh, where that the play that ends with heroes ascent onto Mount Oita, where he is meeting his death and apotheosis. Um, so in a way, we're meant to expect something like that for Oedipus uh, here. The other one is the, the sequel of Oedipus that, I mean, of course, I mean, we wouldn't be, uh, of course, it wasn't, it wasn't um, written, maybe pro written or produced, of course, uh, at the time that Oedipus Tyrannus was produced, Oedipus at Colonus. But I mean, it could have very well been in the mind of the dramatist, where again, finally, we have the we have a version of that ending with Oedipus now not ascending a mountain, but descending, okay, into an underground or a, a lower ground grove, a secret grove of the humanities, and this is a place, uh, the, the, and he does so in an I mean, an atmosphere of um, kind of myth mystic atmosphere with thunderbolts and, you know, um, um, so ascents and kind of descents. This is kind of how uh, um, uh, Sophoclean endings, um, some of, uh, an ascents, important ascents towards ends of life or important descents towards ends of life. This is uh, uh, two ways that uh, we see kind of Sophoclean plays ending with. And it's really, it's really, um, um, it's really kind of strange, not strange, really interesting how the play from Tiresias to the chorus to, the, to Oedipus himself are, um, you know, pre prepare us for uh, Oedipus's ascent on the mountain and yet this doesn't happen and Oedipus is um, forced to go back into the house. Um, um, uh, I mean, what are the reasons for that? I mean, this is a very, there's a very long conversation about this. I mean, Oliver Taplin is a, is a, one of the big kind of uh, exponents of, the, of this uh, kind of part of this uh, conversation. I mean, we all have an opinion about why uh, Oedipus is not allowed to go back on the mountain or is not allowed yet to go back on the mountain? Or do we actually know that he's not gonna go back on the mountain? I mean, we don't know. Um, what is the reason that he goes back into the house? Uh, I mean, there is, there's many theories here. Um, but I mean, it is up to, I would say, the director that kind of puts this on a play. Sorry, I have a feeling that I'm mystifying you. <laughs> uh, I, I think I've tried to kind of uh, put uh, ideas together in a, a very short time, but I mean, um, I, I tried to show you how s central ideas that we know from traditional scholarship can be very much connected with the spatial 
dimension of the play, the visual dimension of the play, the mythical uh, dimension of the play, which is kind of often um, forgotten, and, and how kind of, you know, yeah, space can really be a useful tool for us to kind of revisit. Uh, I mean, I now realize that you can't do that in 45 minutes <laughs> for the back eh, and 45 minutes for Oedipus the King. Nevertheless, what makes me feel good is that at least I've given you the scholarship uh, if you want to read, and I'm more than happy for you. First of all, to, if you want to ask me any questions now, if you want to tell me your ideas now, I, I, including why Oedipus, despite the foreshadowing, it doesn't go to the mountain and is forced to go back into the house, um, uh, or anything else at all. Uh, but yeah, uh, thank you very much for your. Uh, for your uh, attention, and uh, I just want to. So your question was uh, was really kind of yes was was really really kind of to the point, and I'm I'm glad that that you asked that about the earthquake, which is. Okay, Oedipus yes. goes to the house because it's the final brick in the wall. He's now totally isolated, even from the audience, and obviously not in charge. He's Perfect, excellent, totally isolated, and back, you know, up to here, into his past, no? And, uh, yes. And it's also a space of death, isn't it? So in a way, yeah. Any other ideas? Yes? He's going back to where everything started. Yes. Yes, yes. It is. Yes, yes. Um, actually, two questions. One is, what do you make of Dionysus and Pentheus at the end, especially? Yes. And the other one is, could we, the characters of Dionysus and Pentheus, could we read them in the other way around? So Dionysus is quite actually rational in his revenge, in his plan, which is quite methodical, in a way, whereas Pentheus is with his obsession, which is quite irrational obsession with control and all yes, that. Yes, yes. And again, the is all, it's quite hard to embrace the old tragedy. As you said, Dionysus, Dionysus sort of crossing the boundaries. Yes. So, so let's go back to the second one because I, I, I'm not sure I understood. So, so what do you mean the other way around? Usually we, we, we usually say that uh, Dionysus is called subversion and Yes. But it, yeah. but it isn't really, isn't it? So, I mean, yeah. it isn't really. So, and this is what I try to convey here, that, that I mean, Dionysus isn't really only that, yeah. okay? So, uh, I, I mean, there is, there is a very kind of, kind of positive side to the Dionysiac. That, that does come out a lot in, you know, in the play, uh, associated with peace, with kind of fertility, with kind of the feminine, and, um, um, and I mean, it is through the viewpoint of Pentheus that uh, Dionysus is seen as kind of the irrational. And uh, I mean, I completely agree with you that you can see, I think you can see both I mean, in a way, you can see um, Pentheus as the aggressor, but also as the victim, and, you know, and the other way around. Yeah, we feel quite sympathetic with Pentheus. Absolutely. Dionysus looks like... Yes, yes. I mean, tragedy has the... Exactly. Tragedy has the <laughs> tendency to bring things... I mean, to do, make experiments by bringing things to extreme. So this is what happens if you deny and reject the Dionysiac. Let's bring it to the absolute extreme and see what happens. I mean, tragedy often does use these experiments, like Medea, for example, okay? So you bring things to the very, what happens when you have extreme patriarchal ideology that kind of suppresses? And it puts that to the very extreme, what happens is killing of children. So, um, um, uh, so, I mean, uh, uh, you know, often, um, I mean, I, I, I'm sure that there is a lot of ways to answer, answer your question, but this is how I see this is kind of the extreme result of what happens when you reject the, the Dionysiac. Um, in some way. Yeah. Uh, yes. Anything else? Yes? 
digress slightly. I just wondered if you had any thoughts on the dating of your present. Oh, okay. So look, I <laughs> No, no, because, <laughs> no, I'll tell you why. I mean, so do you say, you know, 430, no, 431, or do you, I mean, the thing is, like, I'll tell you, because I've been writing a book on the Euro style, I mean, these are things that are written throughout a playwright's life. I mean, you see that, I think this is a much longer process than just, so he was influenced by, yes, the plague, okay. But I mean, it's a bit of a circular argument, isn't it? Um, so, I mean, I've, I've been thinking about this in relation to the Orestia very much because, I mean, the Orestia must have been, you know, in the create, in, and in, in the process of creation already in the 470s because you see, I mean, because you see elements in the Persians and then you see elements in the Seven Against Thebes that then, you know, uh, become big and key and central you know, in, in the Orestia. So I'm a bit resistant to the, and I, I never ask my students to date. I tell them before or after. So, so why is your question is because of the plague or? Well, yes. I mean, yes, yes. I mean, it, it's a reason to date for it. Yes, it's yes. I mean, okay. So you can, you can, I mean, you can use this. I mean, I, I, it's, it is a circular argument. Yeah. So, uh, but you, and you can, you can tell them this. Uh, that it is a, a circular argument. I mean, but it, I don't know. I mean, I am I'm not a very big fan of dates, especially because I study dramaturgy in the process of the development of a playwright's oeuvre, and then dates don't really make a very, very big ch uh, difference. Um, yeah. Anyway, thank you very much, thank and I hope you enjoy the rest of the day. <laughs>